I just want to, I'm really a very brief warm-up act um, <laughs> for this event. My name's Mel Dodd and I'm Programme Director of Spatial Practice here at Central St Martins. Um, so we are the hosts of this um, marvellous series and uh, very happy to have you. It's an enormous public audience, so some of you may never have been here before, so warm welcome to you. Um, just as a bit of a background, Fundamentals now in its third and final year. It's a, a debate series um, which involves uh, four or five panellists speaking around an issue um, chaired by the marvellous Oliver Wainwright and um, lots of opportunity afterwards for discussion and questions. So please keep yourselves, um, keep making some notes and think about what you want to ask because the more hands that go up, the more we're able to take a proper debate discussion. And um, I think without further ado, I will pass you over to Ollie, so please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Mel, and um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, first off, I want to start with a huge apology uh, to both the audience and the speakers, because when we started Fundamentals two years ago, our kind of chief tenet was to never, ever invite any architects to come and speak, um, not only because they only show pictures of their own work, but because the whole point of Fundamentals was to expose the kind of real forces that are shaping cities. Uh, the developers, the planning agents, the, the land agents that are doing these deals behind closed doors. Um, and as we all know, architects are ultimately powerless in the bigger picture. But we finally relented tonight uh, and invited architects and thought what better way to make them feel uncomfortable than to ask them to speak about beauty. Um, one of the kind of dirtiest words in architecture, I would argue, for the last decade or more. Now, as most of you know, the theme of beauty um, was triggered by the government's decision to set up the Building, Beautiful, sorry, Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, uh, which takes as one of its chief kind of premises uh, the fact that we're not building enough housing is due to public opposition against housing, and the reason there's so much public opposition is because housing is not beautiful enough. Now, last week we started off with the public, asking what do the public really want, what is the public's idea of beauty, and we had a broad range of voices from across the house building sector, including the chair of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, Sir Roger Scruton, who was quite frank and actually admitted that the purpose of the commission may well be to serve as a decoy, uh, a distraction from the real issues that are facing housing delivery, uh, all the kinds of issues we covered before in the fundamentals debates. So as I said, this week we're turning to architects uh, for some questions. One of the implications of the commission is that the profession is still detached from popular taste. The architects are still living in their ivory towers and refusing to honestly engage with what people want. On the one hand, traditional architects are still ridiculed for living in the past and producing dishonest pastiche. Well, on the other hand, we have practices that do claim to be interested in popular taste and yet often end up working, I would say, with their tongues firmly in their cheeks, producing a kind of parody of the popular. Others might argue that we shouldn't even care what the public wants. Surely, as professional tastemakers, it's architects' role to be setting the agenda and leading the way. But either way, beauty has been conspicuously absent, I would argue, from architectural discourse. And it's time to face up to our prejudice and tackle the topic head on. So with me to tackle some of these questions and more tonight, we have five leading architects representing a broad spectrum of different approaches. We're going to begin with Ben Pentry, architect, designer, author, and shopkeeper. Uh, one of the chief architects and master planners of the Poundbury estate in Dorset, and actually the man who convinced me that Poundbury is really rather good. Let's see if he can do the same for you tonight. <laughs> After Ben, we're going to hear from Kate McIntosh, the great modern architect of pioneering social housing schemes in the 60s and 70s for Southwark, Lambeth, East Sussex, and Hampshire. Uh, Kate recently had one of her own projects actually named after her, uh, following a campaign by the residents, which I think there's no higher honour that an architect could ever wish for. Um, following Kate, we'll hear from Diana Yu, who is an associate at Adam Architecture, one of the country's leading classical and traditional practices. Diana's originally from Dallas, Texas, and has worked on a number of large speculative housing projects for the practice in both inner city and rural areas. After Diana, we will hear from Lara Lesmes, architecture, sorry, architect, teacher, and co-founder of Space Popular, a practice that was founded in Bangkok in 2013 and is now based in London. I would say one of the capitals 
most interesting young practices whose colorful work ranges from interiors and exhibitions to the future of virtual environments. And finally, we're going to be ending with Patrick Lynch, founder of Lynch Architects, architect, educator, theorist, and writer, who's worked at all scales, from private houses to an 80 million, office, 80 million pound office building in Victoria. And I was interested to see today his firm is described on his practice, uh, on his website, as general practitioners specializing in beauty and use. So we'll see if that's the case. So over to Ben. <laughs> got five minutes each. <laughs> Ollie's going to ring his bell. <laughs> I'm going to go quickly. Beauty. Weird. I don't really know what we mean by the word beauty. I typed in beautiful face into Google. And it seems that in certain areas of our world, there are very specific uh, meanings. It means you're a woman of a certain young age with black hair, but white skin. And then I thought, well, I'm gay, so I want to see what the men look like. And they also all look the same. And then I typed in beautiful building. And this is what comes up. And I don't know who's an architect in the room. And I thought this was extremely interesting. Um, and I was particularly interested by the, I'm getting some weird kickback on the uh, speaker. That's better. I was particularly interested by the one classical building in the middle row, in the middle of the middle row. And I thought, what's that doing there? And I realized that it was the um, title photo to a rant on uh, Dazeen by Sam Jacob uh, about the Sir Roger Scruton building beautiful commission. And everything else there is a contemporary building, which was interesting. So then I typed in beautiful old building, and again, I don't know about you, but I wasn't in love with many of those ones. And at that point, I kind of gave up on the topic. And to a certain extent, one of my messages tonight is that it's great for architects and people who are interested in these issues of aesthetics to get into a room and worry about the issues of beauty and to worry about the issues of development and progress and how it's all happening. And this is a slide, this is a drawing, I'm sorry it's a little bit fuzzy on the big screen, which I find fascinating because the purpose of the Scruton Commission is really to try and see how builders and house builders, by making their work, quote unquote, more beautiful, can make their work, quote unquote, more popular, and it's a debate that's been running for a long time. This cartoon was drawn in 1829 by George Cruikshank, and it's an illustration called London Going Out of Town. And on the left, you can see smoky London and the terraced streets of Islington bombarding kind of the fields, and you can see a corn stack running away and trees running away and little people running away, and there's an army of chimney pots and builders advancing. And one of the things which I do feel is that we're grappling here with um, a concern which in some ways is eternal in this country, that we're worried about the loss of landscape and we're worried about buildings. And each generation tends to find the buildings that are going up immediately around them sort of troubling, hideous, in some way terrible. And the Victorians hated the kind of the late Regency and by the end of the kind of 20, 19th century, people hated St. Pancras Station down the road, which we now find to be a beautiful Victorian building. And I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that I think there is no such thing as universal beauty in architecture at all. And talking to Roger and his fellow commissioners, I started by sitting down with a pile of books on the subject of how we can make the world more beautiful around us that I have in my office bookshelves, which date back from like the turn of the, the, turn of the last century, 1900, all the way through to the present day. And I was particularly pleased to give them this one on the left, Houses 1952, actually really nice typography on the front cover, and you open it up, 
forward by the Minister of Housing and Local Government. The people need more homes. They need them quickly. This is the most urgent of all social services. At the same time, if you go down a few paragraphs, since we are not dealing with the ephemeral or temporary projects, we must preserve standards, for we have to think of the future as well as of the present. That was written by the then the Housing Minister, Harold Macmillan, in 1952. And I sort of said, are you really sure that it's really worth worrying about any of this? And it's sometimes something which I say to people when they visit Poundbury as well, which Ollie mentioned as the, as, as the place where we first met, which is a development which over the last... Um, 25 years that it's been working. I think we've built 1,900 houses in Poundbury, for better or worse. Um, and uh, I actually um, thought it would be an interesting statistic to pull off the government website. In that same period of time, 5,740,000 5, houses have been built in the UK, which was one of my arguments with the uh, Building Beautiful Commission, don't bother turning up to Poundbury if you want to fix the bigger issues that we're facing. And to a certain extent, I believe that time brings and imparts a charm to all the built environment. This is leafy 1930s suburbia in Leeds, a photograph taken in the 70s. Uh, when these ribbon developments first emerged, there were you know, it's what the Georgian group and the campaign for the preservation of rural England were all set up to stop. And now I walk around 1930s suburbia and I find nothing than charm. This is span housing. Obviously, span housing is a particular sort of uh, cherry of, of, of its type, but there it is. Uh, now much loved. Uh, half of them are listed. They're all being lived in by uh, <coughs> professional architects, uh, restoring them perfectly, putting up 1960s wallpaper and furniture and all the rest of it. Um, architecture goes up and down. I think we should be worried about its robustness. This is a photograph of Notting Hill in the 1960s. Notting Hill in the 1960s was a slum. No one wanted to live there except, frankly, it was the area where Im Im uh, recently arriving immigrants in London ended up in bedsits filled with um, bedbugs. It was famous for bedbugs. That was, uh, that's what you got if you went to Notting Hill. Now, of course, it's uh, 10 million pound houses, each one of these ones. Things come and go, and I think the idea of beauty in architecture and housing is not universal. I'm fascinated by what's happened with council housing and our reaction to kind of monstrous tower blocks, and why do we not feel uh, that the Barbican is a place kind of falling to bits, but you can drive or travel five miles east, and you will find places which are falling to bits. And if you haven't read this book, I, it's the best book I read last year. Absolutely fantastic. This is a building in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, much reviled. Um, I was there last week, and it was turned recently into a beautiful new hotel, having been a disused 1960s office building for years. Things can take, things can move on. In our own work, I'm going to show you two little slides of just some of the stuff we're doing with house builders. That was the product we started with. I've been helping them to redesign it. You can take your pick on the style. That's the house they started with. I've been redesigning it. You can take your pick on the style. I could whiz through images of some of our projects that we're working on in the office where I'm trying to address the issues of kind of how to build beautifully and simply. That last one was in Chichester. This image, this um, set of slides, is a development of 6,000 houses that we're working on a new town in Inverness in Scotland. Uh, very recent construction photos, compare and contrast to the, to the Scottish house builder delivery. That's my bell. Basically, <laughs> I think that as architects, we can get over complicated on this issue. The real world is happening out there all the time. My strong advice to everyone is not to worry about it too much because it's going to happen whatever we say in here. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it more later. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. I'll hand over to Kate McIntosh. <laughs> Mike's working. Yes, I press, you press that, one. that one. Right, thank you. Well, um, basically, I believe with uh, um, 
agree with Roger Scruton that he's being used as a, a decoy. And uh, I wonder that um, he allows himself to be used in that way. Um, I believe that this whole debate of the setting up of the um, post of a beauty tsar is an attempt at dis de -place displacement activity to um, intended to deflect public anger from the legitimized, legalized larceny which is happening all around us. Namely, um, the ever accelerating speed with which public wealth is being transferred to the public sector, often at bargain basement prices and often being sold to non-British uh, residents and um, who are companies which are registered in tax havens. So um, the greatest depletion of public assets is, uh, which is the irreplaceable and um, fundamental finite asset of land. Um, since the coming to power of Margaret Thatcher in 1968, two million hectares of public land have been sold, which is approximately 10% as uh, of all public land has been sold off, worth about 400 billion. So um, this is all set out in a, a marvelous book by uh, an academic, Brett, Brett Christopher's, called The New um, Enclosure, which I recommend to everyone. Having said that, uh, we've been asked to address this question of beauty. Um, <laughs> and uh, it would be odd if I, having practiced architecture for over 40 years, did not subscribe to the idea that beauty is indeed a, a very important quality. However, I would also say that I do not think you can prescribe for beauty. And if you try to do so, um, you'll finish up in a philosophical mess, which I'm sure Roger Scruton is aware of. <laughs> but... I would suggest that um, you can um, say that there are some qualities, the absence of which um, uh, you can uh, say will lead to there no, no, being no beauty. And that my suggestions of um, some of those qualities, which you may agree or disagree with, and you probably have your own list, are as follows. The first and most urgent is sustainability, a sustainable, responsible design. Uh, this was um, one endeavor that uh, I and my late partner, George Finch, um, uh, uh, created in the um, outer suburbs of um, Southampton. It's, um, the outer cladding is, is all timber. Timber's uh, denoted to be um, a carbon neutral material, provided it's not uh, coming from um, uh, tropical rainforests. Um, this uh, is a section and elevation of the site. It's clad in green oak and um, an extremely problematical site, very steep, uh, entirely unsuited for a playground. So we uh, plateaued it into three different levels with a, a bridge across to the main play level, uh, which we hoped and seems to have worked, uh, made the whole development into uh, something redolent of play, um, something exciting. Uh, my next um, criteria is legibility, um, that uh, a design should be um, intelligible to the uninitiated. This is, this is the silhouette of Dawson's Heights, which ironically is the biggest uh, scheme I've ever designed and which was also the first. Um, and um, it's uh, uh, endeavoring to exploit to the maximum the fabulous views that you get from, from the top of this hill. But also uh, on the question of legibility, um, it uh, expresses very vis visibly the system of circulation in that uh, these two towers that you see in the step cigarettes, which are staggered, uh, denote the main entrances. And then from those, you get the 
linear access ways fanning out so everyone can see how you can get around. Um, the, the, the two ziggurats embrace a, a central space which is approximately on the scale of Tavistock Square near which I was living at the time. Um, my third criteria is that the building should, the development should contribute to the public realm. And um, this central space here, which uh, that's as it was at time of handover, um, children from the sub surrounding suburban houses come there out of choice to play. So this is not a ghetto. This is somewhere which, despite its um, being very visible and very different from the buildings round about, has, has been embraced and embedded into the local community. And this space here has genuinely become a public open space. It's been designated as a, a, a nature reserve and uh, so uh, people go there because of the fabulous views to watch the fireworks on November the 5th. And if you're in that area, I invite you to do the same. Um, so, uh, the third and last <laughs> <laughs> is um, response to context and topography. Uh, this is a, an infant school, a replacement infant school, which is on site of a disused Victorian reservoir on a, a south-facing slope. And the... Um, oh, this is another one. Uh, um, the writings of Jane Jacobs and Kevin Lynch were mocked by Andrew Whitaker at our first debate meeting, uh, of which I take great exception. Um, Kevin Lynch emphasized the importance of landmarks, and uh, I'm completely in agreement with him on that. Um, and this is... Uh, an endeavour to create a human scale in a, in a huge sports hall um, in Portsmouth. And uh, also, the spaces between buildings must be as carefully considered as the buildings themselves. This is in relation to a listed grade two building. That's my presentation. <laughs> Thanks for that whirlwind tour. Over to Diana Yu from Adam Architecture. Hello, hello. <laughs> All right, five minutes. Let's, let's get into it. So designing and constructing good quality houses and neighborhoods is an incredibly complex task. I think to do it perfectly is nearly impossible. But in reality, it's, it's a balancing act between time, quality, and cost. I think the industry has managed to break down the building process, though, into various subjects that are studied widely and independently, but rarely do we ever discuss beauty in isolation. Perhaps it's because beauty is not a basic need to our survival. And oftentimes, it's more interconnected with functional and economic aspects of design. But visual aesthetics, at least in the context of more affluent societies, is inherently important to all of us. It's a means of expression is how we understand our identity, whether we realize it or not. I'd argue it's a psychological need. I think we all agree that a well-designed and, and beautiful place encompasses the whole rather than just one part. But without actually breaking it down and studying beauty in isolation, can we understand how it affects us more tangibly and how we can use it objectively to promote good quality design? So the commission was launched on the premise that if we all think something is beautiful, it will get past planning more quickly, it will get constructed more quickly, and it will help us reach our housing targets more quickly. So let's think about it for a moment. That's why we're here, right? So what, what do we think beauty is? Well, for me, beauty is something incredibly simple. It's, it's about our values. Whether or not we actually successfully articulate those values when it comes to our aesthetic choices is a different question altogether. So take this for an example. Someone might look at this and say, it's so charming. I love how it's so quaint and old-fashioned. But they could actually articulate that further by saying, oh, there's an appreciation here for the human scale because of the proportion of the openings and the use of the traditional materials. Or maybe even there's an appreciation for the language because it respects the long-standing 
uh, line of history and supports the continuity of a certain part of British culture. Someone else might look at this and say the total opposite. Oh, it's pastiche, you know, it's not a reflection of our time, it's out of place. I think one speaker from the last talk actually pointed to something similar and said it was unimaginative and regressive. But actually what would have been more interesting is to hear about their underlying values, which is that they place less importance on strengthening ties to history and more importance on novelty, innovation, and change. So once we understand the real values beneath our stylistic choices, we can then have a more productive conversation around beauty. Now, why should we weigh one value more importantly over the other? And why can't we have two different values in design, turning the dials until we reach the sweet spot that resonates with the local community? I think this highlights another point, which is that the values intended are not always the values interpreted. In other words, the values that are expressed along the facade may or may not align with the values of the observer. In the context of this commission and trying to find some sort of uh, consensus around beauty, I think you could define beauty a different way. Beauty could be the alignment of values expressed in design and those of the public. So if this is actually the case, then what better way to resolve our beauty issue than by democratizing the process? I think it's become very apparent that the public feel they should have a say in how new developments are designed. In fact, this poll illustrates that some local communities feel they should have the most say out of political leaders, planners, developers, and architects. So why not? You know, why not just get the local community and a few stakeholders together to sit down and think about the values that they all agree on and want expressed in design? We could break it down and ask a similar question to this one. What single emotion do you think you should have when you think about the look and feel of homes and buildings in your area? I wouldn't really use, I don't agree with the word emotion here, but you could replace with values and, and really dig deep and, and list out all the values which encompass good neighborhood living. And then perhaps this list could be handed off to the architects. The architects could then be, uh, interpret it and express it within a facade. Planning departments could, could be responsible for assessing whether or not the degree of interpretation is relatively accurate and acceptable. And who knows? Um, we might find a few positive effects from this process. Perhaps it will allow the public to start thinking about what makes a good neighborhood. I mean, some of these concepts come second nature to, to us in the industry, but are actually rather complex to someone outside. It could allow the professionals to be a little bit more clued in on what the public actually want. Maybe we find we need to speak in a less highbrow language and speak more directly and to the point. I think getting people together and really thinking about and defining what collective values they currently share could potentially unify neighborhoods, you know, create this shared platform where, where differences could be accepted. When new people come in, seeing an intentional architectural language which reflects current values could be a really nice roadmap into understanding the neighborhood and, and foster integration. And lastly, this process could give a higher degree of trust and credibility back to industry professionals when we establish this mutual understanding around values. Moving forward, maybe the people will want more well-considered modern housing. Maybe they'll want a more nuanced cross-section of styles that reflects a more complex and diverse neighborhood. Or maybe we might find more eco -friendly, a more eco-friendly functional aesthetic which reflects a more sustainable and practical neighborhood. Or maybe we might even find people want more <laughs> traditional housing. <laughs> But um, I think in this hypothetical scenario, it begs the question, should a distinction be made between temporary and permanent residents in this vote of values? And how do we incentivize what is effectively a capitalist model to consider wider community values? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'll just wrap it up really quick. Um, I think until we understand architecture, that architecture is this language of values, our, our buildings will always be devoid of meaning and will never truly resonate with the public. But if we can take this understanding of beauty and combine it with good urban and practical architectural principles and perhaps, perhaps instill you know, a degree of affordability in there, then I think we'd be more than capable of creating beautiful places for thriving communities. Thank you. Great, thank you, Diana. Almost exactly on time there, so bonus points. Yeah. The sound is really... Um, is it too much? Too echoey. Can we make it less echoey? <laughs>
Um, right, over to Lara Lesmes from Space Popular. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to go through a few ideas that relate pretty much to, to our own work, which is what you were only dreading that we would do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I would like to start talking about uh, how the Western mentality presents beauty as a standard of comparison. We seem to think we should be capable of measuring which building is and will always be the most beautiful, which street is the prettiest, which city is best. This conviction comes from a past, when there was actually a degree of certainty as to what beauty was. However, in modern times, we seem to be rather more confused. The 19th century saw a wave of beauty anxiety in the form of style worries. Historicism and the appropriation of styles led to such a wide range of options that architects became overwhelmed by choice. The 20th century had a very clear answer to this. However, we still find ourselves here trying to figure out beauty again. Today, our scientific minds have a certain uncomfort with the perception of beauty being a highly subjective and, and, and individual matter. So we turn to democratic ideals, voting or polls like Diana was showing in order to set criteria. And in doing so, we turn beauty into some kind of agreement. In parallel, there has been recently great hopes for the sciences to put an end to our beauty angst and give us finite, measurable answers with neuroscience taking the stage. What uh, the internet and science both offer are forms of measurement as a way out of our dear and feared subjective individualism a way to escape from the scary notion of subjectivity and onto the green fields of reliable, stable, and measurable objectivity, as opposed to its fleeting, wobbly, and shifty counterparts. Um, when we look at these very adjectives as describing of architecture, it, there seems to be an obvious choice, because who wants fleeting, wobbly, and shifty buildings? <laughs> well, for reasons that are honestly a bit beyond our understanding, my partner and I have found ourselves doing precisely this, pretty much fleeting, shifty, and wobbly buildings. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, stages built of printed fabric supported by absurdly thin structures, interiors that are built of curtains and removable ensembles of furniture, hypostyle rooms that can be put up in a day, and now even houses so light that have trouble not flying away, actually. Even when we design buildings with greater mass, we heavily rely on superficial qualities, such as color and ornamentation. It recently dawned on us that perhaps it is the other side of our practice, that which deals with the virtual, that is heavily influencing our built works. The imminent, the imminent addition of a third dimension to our digital lives opens up for a whole new form of practicing as an architect. However, taking the virtual as a site is a rather daunting task. If you thought that it was hard to deal with beauty uh, in, in the physical world, then wait until you take on the virtual and a whole new set of complexities and wobbles. In fact, we have recently conducted research on what could constitute value in the virtual. So we went on to do this chart, trying to understand how we value architecture today, like all of us, not just architects. And we looked at which ones of these qualities are quantitative and which ones are qualitative, and we observed that the only ones that are transferable to the virtual are the scary ones, the ones that are unmeasurable, subjective, and qualitative. <coughs> this renders the possibility of value in architecture in objective terms basically impossible, as we have no measure for it. However, this has not stopped early attempts to value virtual architecture. At the risk of diverting a little bit from the um, topic of beauty and going a bit more into the discussion of value, I would like to just show a few examples. What we are seeing here is the second most expensive building in the digital marketplace. We were actually rather excited to find this out because it's one of our favorites, and particularly Frederick's. And um, we think, I mean, it probably costs that much, mainly for the level of detail and the quality of the meshes. <laughs> Uh, one would think. However, when you look at other examples uh, on that <coughs> price range, you find that there seems to be uh, value in the meaning, aesthetics, and even the process behind them. This is actually a photograph of probably something someone built to then 3D scan to then create a virtual model. So here is where it starts um, getting really interesting. There, there, we seem to find beauty and certainly value um, in that where we can perceive effort and intention. And this brings me to a notion that has been 
taken our, in our mind for, for quite some time now, that is the notion of effort heuristic. Um, the mental rule of thumb in which the worth of an object is determined from the perceived amount of efforts that went into producing it. With our own experiences, we then internalize effort as a valuable commodity, and we project value onto things uh, based on how we think they got done. This might explain the forming of taste ghettos within disciplines, why architects seem to all like something because they understand what goes into the making of that thing. Um, and as we emphasize more, e we emphasize more easily with what uh, we have experienced firsthand. But it also explains how the digital world is challenging systems of measure and systems of truth. Our most appreciated piece of work, judging for the one where people was almost brought to tears, <laughs> has been a virtual one, where every bit was conceived and built by us. Um, with a complex but, cl but clear intention in mind, and yet a certain degree of abstraction. People say, said they felt embraced by the architecture and touched by the care and thought they could perceive in it. They thought they could see us behind the work, and that was a moment of, it was that moment of connection that brought the experience of beauty. Did, this brings me to think that beauty in architecture might be perhaps our most sophisticated form of communication and that therefore beauty is perhaps not something to be measured, rather a language to be spoken. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, exactly on the gong. It's all the training in those virtual environments. <laughs> Finally, over to Patrick Lynch. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Oh, sorry, big pun. What do I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is uh, the Acropolis. Um, and mostly what we talk about is the vertical stuff that looks pretty. But half of it is actually deep stuff, matter, earth, ground, death. Um, I don't know why it doesn't work. There we go. Um, at the beginning of uh, Western culture, when Plato begins to posit the idea that reason is more important than heroism in battle, um, architecture and philosophy are absolutely entwined. The examples he gives are, of goodness are geometric, so complex issues are more complex geometric shapes, simple issues, more simple shapes, and the city is the space in which beauty and goodness are brought together by architects, which is why I think people like Roger Scruton and philosophers are interested in architecture and why politicians are interested in uh, philosophers trying to tell architects what to do. I would argue architecture is fundamentally philosophical because it deals with what is good as well as what is beautiful. Um, the idea that beauty is light and it, and, it, and, it, and it makes other things appear beautiful seems to me a kind of moral and ethical aspect. And uh, Gadamer puts forward the idea that actually what it does, it makes other things appear more beautiful. Um, this, in effect, is a kind of what I, how I would kind of reconstruct an architectural theory course that begins with rhythm, dance, matter, death, light, and then chronologically kind of gets us to what Tim Morton calls dark ecology. I'm going to talk about Tim in a bit, but along the way, you're basically kind of seeing how kind of geometry, rhythm, etc., blah, 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 city... God, individuality, subjectivity, blah, 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 works. Now, in the middle of that is Alberti, who tries to codify this geometrically. This is the facade that he ch chucks on the medieval cloister of Santa Maria Novella, and complex and simple geometric figures, i.e. circles and God and things which are more worldly, grounded, etc., come together. Plato Rucellai, he does this amazing thing. He adds a stoa because he tells the people in his um, architectural treatise that if you want people to love you and you want to make things which are beautiful, you have to be virtuous and you need to be seen to be virtuous. So he persuades the Ritualai family to build this stoa to allow people to put a market in and when they're parading through the town during the festival of Bacchus and Ariadne, um, they stand there and they, 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 they handed things out people and there was a bench for the servants to 
hold the horses, it's now a bang and polish and shop, sadly. In contrast to that kind of world of, of, of rules and, and geometry and stuff, there's also this kind of phenomenological thing of experience. Michelangelo is a great example of this. He's drawing a hand, turning a page, or he's thinking of how you sit in a bench in the library. But still there's this structure from darkness to light, where light equals knowledge and the body is something other. Um, matter here is transformed by being polished into a kind of idea of, of resurrection. Um, this then extends into the Florence as part of the city, where the city itself is beautiful and idealized. And that really is this kind of moral construct. Now, I was going to show you some stuff that I think these basic kind of dialectics of dark and light kind of show. This is the Chapel of Resurrection by Sigurd Leverance, arguably the best architect of the 20th century. Certainly the most witty, the most intelligent. Um, <laughs> through a forest, there's an approach towards a building. Its portico is oriented to that path, which is the world. And the chapel is oriented on cardinal orientation, north, south, east, west. And at noon, light shines and hits the altar and the catafalque and thus the kind of resurrection of the body. It's Christian kind of exegesis of that pagan stuff about light and dark. And that runs through 20th century architecture and design. Um, Adolf Attia's stage set. Um, Heidegger and Chilida working together. So philosophers and artists kind of in architects working together. Robert Irwin, uh, an amazing American perceptual artist who is in a sense saying the world is what's most beautiful and your perception is what's most beautiful. And thus we have this kind of idea that the world is something that really is the site of art. I recently published a book, I'm a publisher as well, David Randolph's photograph, called, the book is called Still Beautiful. What David realized when he was taking photographs, um, incidentally, was he was recording the ice melt. And he's now been making a project about the kind of destruction of the natural world through uh, Soviet weapon technology, et cetera, et cetera. And this extends to the Dead Sea. This is a photograph which is pathetically beautiful. What you're looking at is the depletion of the Dead Sea, the water's being used for um, uh, concrete to make refugee camps and desalinization. So there's a kind of haunting quality to this, to this beauty, which is that's kind of dark. Now, I can't know, I don't know why it's not doing what I want it to do. Um, this is a house for an artist that we did a few, for a long time ago. I'm, just, I'm not really going to say much about this, but I ho hope you can see that these themes kind of are translatable into design today. Um, unlike most architects, I don't wear the same clothes in every situation that I'm in, which I think is key. This is a project for Westminster Cathedral Piazza. This is a garden of remembrance we've just completed. Um, the monument at the end is polished concrete, so you not only is your shadow within it, your body is reflected. Um, the ground that you sit on isn't. This is a housing block. Now, a lot of the rules that this commission is trying to set out are already inscribed in law. Um, in the London plan, and effectively plan, planning legislation, everybody is by law, as kind of aspect of human rights, given outside space and access to natural daylight, but not so much that you need to use fossil fuel technology in order to cool your, your building. There are certain things architects can't do, and in the past they didn't do, which I think is important to respect the work of artists and other collaborators. And this is a, an artwork called Silver Forest by Rip Blaze Luxembourg and by the Westminster City Hall. Now, just to conclude, I said I was going to read something. I mentioned Tim Morton earlier. Tim is an Englishman. He's a professor of uh, English at the University of at Rice University in Houston. Um, he <coughs> last week was on stage with Laurie Anderson. Uh, he's a friend of Bjork, he's performed, because he's an interest in romantic poetry, he's not afraid to talk about beauty, and he's not afraid to talk about darkness and blackness and death. This is Tim's take on beauty in his, from his recent book, Being Ecological. The ecological society to come, then, must be a bit haphazard. Broken, lame, twisted, ironic, silly, sad. Yes, sad, in the sense meant by a character in the, in the British science fiction television series, Doctor Who, 
Sad is happy for deep people. Beauty is sad like that. Sadness means there's something you can't quite put your finger on. You can't quite grasp it. You have no idea who your boyfriend really is. This is not my beautiful wife, he's quoting Talking Heads. <laughs> which means in turn that beauty isn't graspable either. Beauty is such, which means that beauty must be fringed with some kind of slight disgust. Something that normative aesthetic theories are constantly trying to wipe off. There needs to be this ambiguous space between art and kitsch, beauty and disgust. A shifting world, a world of love, of philos, a world of seduction and repulsion rather than authority, of truthiness rather than rigid truth versus rigid false. Truth is just 1,000 DPI kind of truthiness. This isn't the same at all as saying everything is a lie. That's a statement that's trying not to be truthy, which is why it ends up contradicting itself. If everything is a lie, then the sentence, everything is a lie, must also be a lie, and so on. Fantastic. What a poignant note to end our presentations on. Can I invite the speakers to come and join me on the stage in these beautiful thrones uh, in the order that you spoke in, if possible? <laughs> Which now so, we need so to. So the <laughs> sound man can figure it out. <laughs> So it's Paddy here. I think, think we do. I think we do. Think that come out <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. Yes, she did. And can I ask the audience to be busy <laughs> thinking up questions and points that you want to grill our panel on? So I'm going to open it up to you guys fairly yeah, soon. I should give you third degree. Um, right? I'm just going to start with one question. I suppose trying to bring it back a bit to the commission, because I want these debates to be useful. <laughs> I know there's members of the commission in the audience, and we're trying to be productive. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention, so, so Roger Scruton writes a lot about um, how architecture and, and kind of urban planning and creating community um, has a certain similarity with like hosting a dinner party. He talks a lot about manners and laying the table and how everything kind of has its place and there's a certain grammar and set of manners that architects should kind of keep within. Now I'd just like to put that to all of you in turn. You know, is, is there a kind of consensual order or grammar or set of rules that architects should abide by, or have we gone beyond that? Ben, can I, I, I start with you? I think we've gone way beyond that. Um, uh, I think for a start, you've got to decide if you're hosting a dinner party, or if you're having a rave, or whatever you're doing with your friends. I, 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 I feel that architecture has gone way beyond that. And I think that, I mean, I'm, sadly, I missed the last debate, but some of the other issues that you were touching on, Ollie, I think really are the, the ones which are pertinent, which is in a sense what I was trying to say in that talk to do with um, the, the numbers game, that the numbers of housing that is being built by people who have nothing to do with, unfortunately, anything we're talking about in the room, or which I think the commission will really end up talking about. But there is such a volume of housing, like you say, that we need to build, wouldn't it help to have some basic series of, of rules? Now, Liza Fior in the last debate mentioned that you know, all windows should have the golden section, maybe <laughs> half jokingly. But you know, it was a kind of principle mm. that we could follow. I don't know. Kate, what, what's your take on, on the idea of a, of a grammar? Say um, again, Liza. It was a question. <laughs> yeah, should all windows be golden yeah. sections? No. <laughs> <laughs> some should be square. Um, well, as I said in my presentation, I don't think you can um, prescribe for um, beauty, but there are certain constraints or measures that I would place on anything. Uh, one, one is that it, it must be sensitive to context, and that if, if the context is very unsympathetic, that can be in, the, um, in a, a reaction against. Um, it, th there should also be, uh, and in the authorities I've worked with, uh, that is something we've always striven for, a contribution to the public realm. Um, and um, the trouble with the commodification of housing is that um, the brief is written so that the architect is obliged and constrained and corralled into simply trying to squeeze the last possible pound out of this development and I've seen uh, <coughs> illustrations of recent um, designs by very very competent architects but the 
communal spaces are squeezed down to the point of claustrophobia. Um, and the, the relationship between the buildings and the surrounding uh, is bleak in the extreme, so we cannot see anywhere at the base of this uh, mini tower block where you would feel happy to sit or happy for a child's play. That's the other thing that uh, um, I, I try to emphasize at every possible presentation, is in any, any development, think how this will impact on a child. The, they, and the, they, they have no votes, they have no voice in politics, so they, they get squeezed out of this ultra-commercial world in which we're trying to survive. Diana. I think to some extent we already abide by some rules simply by practical constraints. You know, levels of affordability and sustainability, and we all want a little bit of green space, uh, and also obviously building red supply as well. Um, but I think we need to remember that we are talking about beauty in the context of our housing and, and that our values when it comes to our day-to-day -day living is things like security, familiarity, and stability. So whether or not that means that people need balance in the facades, perhaps. Um, so I think in that, if we kind of hone down the context we're talking about beauty, we, we may be able to actually decide what those rules actually mean for us. Laura. Well, <laughs> I, my thoughts on this particular matter, which I didn't particularly address in the presentation, is that uh, it is hard to set up a series of rules that address public opinion. I think we have now some of the most powerful tools to look at public opinion, as in like uh, open Pinterest, if you want to know what people <laughs> want. The problem is that you open Pinterest today and you open it tomorrow, and they want a different thing, right? So uh, how does architecture as a slow discipline deal with that. So uh, the thing is that I think probably something like this beauty commission would be more useful um, at, in the realm of education, perhaps, to make sure that all architects leave school having a basic understanding of uh, what, what it, how do you design something and immerse yourself in it in a responsible manner, because you're only gonna draw it and then eventually it's gonna get built with a lot of resources and so on. Uh, but as <coughs> to a response for the general public, I think there is a lot of indicators and a lot of places to look at uh, where public taste is being formed and incredibly powerful tools that should be looked at if that would be the, the ambition to respond to what the public wants now. Patrick, what's your take? Um, <coughs> well, I just think th th there just are. But the thing is that government policy um, and kind of scientific knowledge and the kind of evolution of design happen at different rates. So we're designing, um, with Liza at the moment, a housing scheme um, for a council. I can't talk about it, I can't show you it yet. But you, what, what you find often is that what, what design does is it kind of tries to deal with kind of d different sort of system softwares that don't work at the same speed. So yeah. th there's in the, the the, the London plan, the absolute demand for lux levels of different varying uh, kind of quantities of light in certain rooms. And that leads you ultimately to making lots of glass because it's the only way to get the lux levels. But in the London plan as well, there's information which relates to uh, projected temperature rises over the next 25 years which means the more glass you get, the more hot your building gets. But there's another part of the London plan and building regulations, which is linked to planning law, which is about not being allowed to put fossil fuel technology, i.e. air conditioning, in buildings. So then you have this kind of strange situation where the more light you get, the more heat you get, blah, blah, blah. So then you need to be ingenious and design something. So the way we're solving it is by exposing the concrete soffit because you open these big windows at night in the summer when there's no clouds in the sky and the building gets cold. And then this suddenly becomes a virtue because it's worth more because the floor to ceiling heights are higher and you've got a loft aesthetic. But we didn't set out to do a loft aesthetic. It's just what you get when, as a, you know, it's practice. Um, the, the, I don't think design is a compromise. I, and I don't think it's about rules. I think it's something else. It's creative, imaginative thinking. And it, it's, it's very difficult to describe because it doesn't, it's like, you know, are, are there enough good architects and good developers? I mean, that, that's the kind of, you know, 
blue sky, perfect world, utopian scenario. I but actually, do we need some pattern books and some basic models for the less competent house builders question. to, to think, be following? I, I think, okay, I think, the I think, segue question. I think, I think there's a problem about, about creativity and imagination, per se. Uh, one of my old tutors once said in response to somebody said, um, no, what about when you have a really good idea? He said, well, I tend to find that um, you know, when it's a really good idea, it's had me. And, and, and that kind of relationship you have with your own work and with the world around you, the people that are paying for it, the people that are going to be in it, your imaginative empathy, your own memories, your own knowledge of it, is kind of performative. You're, it's kind of happening to you and it's live. And um, I, was, I, I love the quote from Mike Tyson, which was, um, you know, everybody's got a plan until they punch you in the mouth. <laughs> You know, that's what consultation does. That's what meeting people, planners. I think arguably we need better planners. I'm fortunate to be working in Hackney and in Westminster. The planners are amazing. They're really clever. They're, they're by far the cleverest people in the room almost always. They're honest. They're straightforward. They like old buildings and they like modern buildings. And most architects get kind of a bit like they like old buildings until they go to architecture school. And then, you know, it, it, there's something weird in, in our education system at the moment about what reality is and what creativity is. Mm. I think that's... So just problem. continue with the second part of my question. How do we fundamentally raise the quality of the kind of lowest common denominator? We can't trust that, that all house builders have good design as their intention. What, what one recommendation would you give to the commission to, to head in that direction? Whoever wants to jump in first, feel free. I think what you've got to understand first is what language you're trying to speak. And that's a separate question from what... I think you were referring to Roger saying, because I think he's got a view that potentially everyone should be speaking the same language. There's a consensus. He, he's trying to reach he, some kind of consensus. And I think, in a sense, looking at the statistics which Diana was uh, putting on her presentation, you can, you can pick your statistics and you can pick your language. But I think that within the language that the house building industry operates, there is a lot that could be done to simplify their um, product and to probably make it look a bit better quite easily. I think that would be possible. I think there are dozens of people in this room. Like what? Can you just give a concrete example of what, what simple measure? Well, I put some images on, a, on the little slide presentation, which admittedly I whizzed through very quickly, but where, where we were working with a house builder down in Devon who had um, a, a pretty crap house, housing stock standard um, uh, plan book, which they, they knew it was um, uh, pretty bad. Um, they didn't really care particularly that it was pretty bad, but um, unfortunately for them, somebody put them in touch with me and we were asked to go through a redesign process of their housing types. And it was 90% um, of the time, it was a question of just making it a bit simpler, taking off the kind of strip of fake wood that was being bolted to the outside of the building because probably 15 years earlier, a, a trendy architect in London had done that and they'd put it on, you know, the, a, the cover of the AJ Journal and the, um, the technologist in their office designing house types 15 years ago thought that would be a fun thing to try. You, you can see how these things filter from a high level down to a, down to a low level. I mean, to a certain extent, Poundbury and mm. has, has uh, spawned... Um, you know, millions of hideous imitators, and we can see them all uh, all over the country. We've made things possibly a bit too complicated for house builders to take to take on, but I think there are a lot of things which you could very simply work through and calm it down a bit, give them some basic rules mm. as to kind of what makes a slightly more sensible layout, et cetera, et cetera, which could be quite easily done. And when I was talking to the commission a couple of days ago, a few days ago, we were beginning to try and unpick what would those kind of five things be. Mm. Um, Any but that's a yeah. separate debate from the question of beauty in architecture I think and architects divorced from yeah. the public. Who else would like to interject? I, I would like to uh, talk about something. As a, if, if we were to <laughs> pick one word to give advice, which may be sounds Yeah, uh, please uh, do. What, uh, it seems like from the point of view of a, of a young practitioner, give people the chance. I mean, give more people the chance. Often, as a young architect, it takes so long to get a chance, and you do have the energy. And I personally believe that when someone with that amount of energy gets the chance, they are going to give heart and soul into whatever experiment, so it's taking a bit of a risk, 
However, you know that uh, everything is going to be lo looked into. Uh, contractors are going to be like talked to every day and try to like do things that are impossible to do. Like we are doing acrobatics with this first house we're building in Spain to try and deliver mm. something that is pleasurable, that has enough shading in a place like Spain, where, <laughs> where if we were to follow the all the rules of the planning permission to maximize the size of the house, it would be a horrible house. So. And you need to put a lot of energy in order to do that. I am not saying that someone that has more experience would put less energy, but that perhaps with m more younger practices were given the chance, there could be we could be seeing um, new approaches. Yeah, okay. Kate, oh. um, sorry, then Paddy. Um, if um, you're asking us what advice can we give to Roger Scruton as to how he can improve the standard of design coming forward, I would uh, like to urge him. Um, to look at the harm that the design and build form of contract has uh, had um, in um, undermining the, uh, the authority and the um, prestige that uh, creative people, architects, uh, have, and that um, if he could be convinced of that, and uh, he has the air of government, we could see a genuine improvement coming out of this exercise. My fear is that this is going to be something akin to uh, the 1984 Ministry of Truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one thing we could start doing is just taking stock of the current housing that's being built. You know, I think I saw an interesting study done by the, I think it was called the New, New Transport for Homes. Just strictly looking at new developments all across England, they said across the board, all planning has been done in isolation. So houses are just being built in numbers. Not There's no kind of consideration to how close is it to a transport hub or is there any local amenities that are provided to support this number of, of new homes? So I think that's a good probably starting point. Paddy, recommendations? Um, when I was in my fourth year, I went to study in Lyon for a semester and I did a a, a module called Avenue de Logement, which was uh, housing and urbanism. And it was the only housing project I ever did when I was a student. And when I came home, I asked uh, the prof, head of school at Liverpool, why? And he said, we leave that sort of thing for the boys at the poly. <laughs> and Stephen Bates is the professor of uh, urbanism and housing in Munich. I, I think we have to start taking the training of architects seriously. And you can't just make it up on your own. There, there is a world that expects um, us to have professional knowledge. So if we want to get regain prestige and we want to be able to operate, not just with a design build scenario, with some authority and to deal with issues about tectonics, not just style, I stuff that's going to fall off rather than be robust and weather. I just think <coughs> it needs to be taken seriously. And I think what we've got is this, all the schools are desperately trying to involve practitioners in education. But then if you get a job in education, you can no longer practice because they see they're quite greedy about mm. our time. Design is not seen as research unless you can convert it into a book and you have a PhD, blah, 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 blah. But design itself is a form of knowledge. It's, it's not necessarily scientific knowledge. It's not necessarily just tradition. It's something which evolves like language, like poetry, like music, like politics. But it, but it seems that there's a, there's a sort of slight disconnect, I think, between how, how we think about, you know, it's like we, we, we all know what we don't like, but we really have kind of methodology of talking about what we do like and why it might be mm. good and better. And I think we need to take it seriously because we have a housing crisis. The last thing I say is whenever I speak to students and, and they keep talking about what they want, I always say to them, look, how much meat do you eat anymore? Not very much. Okay, so your politics, most young people's politics are kind of the far to the left of Jeremy Corbyn, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you get them onto LGBT issues, blah, 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 blah. But their attitude towards design in design schools is still fundamentally narcissistic, solipsistic, and very, very right wing. They all think Zaha Hadid's a really good example. Now, obviously, she's a brilliant architect in many ways, but could Zaha Hadid tackle housing? You know, could she design a street? Could she design a city quarter? There's, 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 I think we all want to be over there doing that, but actually, the real problem that we have as human beings and as citizens is it's a, a good challenge to at least it. half of the audience, I would <laughs> say. Right, time to open it up for questions. I've seen two hands already, so we're going to have the first one here, and the second one, the stripey arm poking up in the middle. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Yeah. 
Is on. Yes, hello. Is, uh, is it on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's Robert Adam. I, I'm, I just want to um, put something to my good friend Ben, um, who made the very good point, I think, that um, the shadow of taste moves on, um, and that's inevitable. But I think the, if you moving from an argument about what, was, um, what is loved now, well, eventually lots of people will probably hate it, is not quite the same argument as what's hated now is lots of people will probably eventually love it. Because the, where that argument takes you is that actually you don't really care um, about what anybody thinks. Um, uh, uh, I mean, much as I like what you do, Ben, I think the consequences of your argument are potentially pernicious. And so I, I put it mm. to everybody generally. Uh, there is a lot of evidence, actually. There's a, there's a huge amount of evidence um, for what the generality of people like. How much attention should we pay to that? Ben, maybe you go first. <laughs> I agree with you, Bob. But <laughs> as the person interested in aesthetics, deeply interested in aesthetics, I've sort of come to a personal conclusion that the only way that I can stay a sane and happy person is actually not to worry about that question too much. Because, and I was interested to see a little letter from Ptolemy Dean in the Times in response to a big article on this very subject, talking about Ian Nairn, uh, who many in the room will enjoy and know his incredible books, who I hadn't known, but he had um, been driven to an early death, age 58, dying of despair and drink at the kind of the state of the built, of, uh, built environment around him. And I think that's kind of... The fate you know, that you awaits can, all architecture you critics. Can, you, can go, you can go a little, <laughs> yeah, you can go a little crazy. And I, I, I understand what you're saying, Bob. In my personal work and life, I try and design buildings that I think will be popular and which people will like and which are actually not even the complicated word of beauty, but I like to use pretty. It's a much less uh, <laughs> um, uh, controversial word, or maybe it's not. Um, I don't, but I've, I've sort of learned over the years that if you just make something look nice, and, if, uh, and the, on the sites where I am you know, given a commission, I'll work hard, very hard, to make sure that every aspect of them responds to what you've been talking about and what Paddy's been talking about as best, to the best of my ability. But I've sort of learned that to worry beyond the job which is in front of me in the drawing board, there, therein lies madness. And I look at my old mum sometimes, uh, who's in her mid-80s and is very angry about the whole world in general. <laughs> and I say to her that if you want to be a happy person, only worry about the things which you can directly control. And by building lots of things which look nice, <coughs> maybe you can have an influence. But by talking about it too much, I think you go a bit mad. Does anyone else want to respond? Or next yeah. question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have immense sympathy for the point you just made, Robert. But um, um, Sir Roger Scruton, when he was here a couple of weeks ago, um, was obviously very concerned that, uh, and he's written as much as uh, uh, several times, the uh, number of buildings going up which are uh, ugly. I would subscribe and submit to you that if this is the case, these buildings are an honest reflection of the ugly intent behind the building. Yes. If you look around at the way the skyline of St. the City of London is being obliterated day on day, what you have is a series of competitive logos, in effect, which they quite accurately express this drive, this commodification, that we are going to squeeze the last possible drop of profit out of this plot of land. You cannot produce a building, a beautiful building, out of an ugly intent. So the strike the arm in the middle. <laughs> so can the stripey arm raise itself again yeah, and wave hello, a bit more? Stripey arm, it is Adrian. Um, <laughs> hello. Um, I, I have a couple of concerns and I am intrigued by a couple of things, um, if I may articulate this. Um, 
I think, and thank you for, for your last comment, that what we are talking about and what would be interesting for me to talk about is the politics of beauty within the architecture profession, really. And um, what intrigues me is uh, the, the subtitle of this debate, which is, is the profession detached from popular taste? Well, of course it is. <laughs> and the question itself shows us that the profession is differentiating itself from popular tastes, <laughs> i.e. beauty has been always used by architects and by the architectural profession as a strategy to legitimize the profession and separate it from the people it is serving. That's at least my view. So I would love to have a campaign to just scrap absolutely the, the, the uh, concept of beauty in architecture. So I would ask the panel, would you, how would you imagine yourself as an architect which doesn't have to tackle or to deliver beauty? Because beauty has been hijacked, not only by the profession, <coughs> but as rightly so, the lady just said, by the corporation to legitimize the intent behind the elitism that the profession itself complicit, is complicit with, intentionally or not. There's the question how to close the gap between how to close the gap and, and, and how, popular taste. Uh, what do you think, for instance, about collaboration, participation, <laughs> these, these kind of new practices that are opening up the profession? How, how do we bridge that gulf between yeah. the people and the Yeah, and, and why and is it to do with housing only? What about public space? Yeah. I Diana. Think, I think that was actually along the lines of my whole point of, of mm. kind of democratizing the process. And <laughs> The question that I did ask in my presentation was how do we incentivize what is effectively a capitalist model to consider wider community values? Like what, what is the business incentive here? Because that, I mean, we all have to profit. We all have to run a business, right? So I think it's important. I think we are, we are definitely detached from what the public wants. Um, I asked my friends what houses that they would ideally like and their answers varied like all over the place. So to, to some extent, I, I, I would never have even predicted some of their responses. Is there so a lack of architectural education in the public? Is that something we're concerned about? Should we be like Neil Pinder at Gravesney School, you know, teaching architecture at high school level? Is that something? That is actually quite an interesting point because, I mean, there is art education in schools. There is no, usually, generally, no architecture education. Now we're seeing more and more, uh, like, I was part of uh, some initiatives that CEA is running of, like, with working with children and architectural education which I think would change things a lot. But I also think new tools are becoming a very available, new design tools that decode um, the usual design representations that have usually been a bit cryptic towards the general public when you are at a design stage. Right. So I think also probably embracing new forms of representation and new tools for design could open for um, involving what we are calling the general public. Okay. I, th I think the um, point the uh, last uh, questioner was raising was the severance between the architect profession and the user client. Now, this is an age-old problem, but it hasn't <coughs> been helped in any way by the um, housing provision being handed over virtually lock, stock, and barrel to um, the volume house builders. Who, um, and even, of course, when you come to hospitals and other parts of the public estate, um, if it's going through the, the process of um, a PFI, the, the um, connection between the architect designer and the user, who in that case, of course, would be the medical profession, is completely severed. The, the brief is prepared by the developer. And so this is a structural problem in the way commissions are handed out. And I would submit that, defective though in many ways it was, the provision of housing coming through the um, democratically elected local authorities w was a, a step towards some sort of connection with the, the user client. Some, some authorities were more open to the uh, architects <coughs> in-house actually being able to talk to the client body, the user client body, or at least the housing manager. But now that is totally impossible. Paddy, do you get to speak to your user clients, or are they 
imaginary buy to let landlords? What's the. What's I, the think, I think there's a, there's a. I mean, the planning authorities, you can't. I mean, the idea that you have a, you have a brief is not really quite true, I don't think, anymore. What, what happens is the planning brief exists, um, the client has a brief. I mean, we're. I, I also would take a slight issue about the, the issue of money with this. Um, that we're doing a, pro a project at the moment, um, uh, which is uh, uh, two thirds uh, affordable housing. Uh, 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 almost half of it is social needs rented for very poor people, and one third of it is market housing. And the market housing is worth that much, and it, the contract sum is that much. And so it's cost free to the local authority, which I think is a you know that's that's a good thing, hmm. you know because. You know, un unless you're going to have an extremely progressive government with a tax hate, um, it's very difficult to imagine a return to that type of situation where the kind of gentleman architect sat in the, 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 the town hall and was, was taken seriously by, um, and, and, and in fact had authority. I think, I think there's a kind of there's a problem, because as, as, as many talented modern architects as there were, you know, I mean, modernism's really hard to do well. You know, arguably Georgian is, is you know... Architecture is hard to do well, full <laughs> stop. Yeah, but, but you can see why. It's easy. <laughs> but you can see why. I mean, Ben didn't study architecture, right? Ben's a friend of mine. He studied art history. He did a year at Princeton Wales School of Architecture, but he's a really good architect because he avoided the problem of going into an architecture school and having... Doesn't have the neuroses yeah, that and most and of us... Well, well just having, a, having his brain sucked out and, and filled with bogus metaphors and a kind of strange... Kind of it's true. messianic way of thinking. Can I move on to some more questions? Transfer school that, uh, this hand's been up for a long time, so we'll have this one in the front row next, and then behind in the second row. Um, the, the work of uh, Hawksmoor and Lanston and um, Sterling is not beautiful, um, but it is sublime. Um, is, um, is this the right quest to seek beauty? Who's not, whose work isn't beautiful? Hawksmoor and Lasden and Sterling. Should it be the, the sublime commission? Is that what we're, we're looking for? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's um, Somerset's idea about the grotesque, isn't it? And, and I mean, that's partly what I was kind of getting at. There's a kind of element of, of darkness in, in true beauty, which is, you know, scary and wonderful and exciting. And, um, yeah, and you don't want a whole world of beauty. No, no. It's exhausting, you know. It's really boring. Mainly prettiness with, <laughs> with the odd bit of... 100% um, beauty, if you're in an environment of 100% beauty, is actually exhausting and boring. There's a problem and in Poundbury. How, how do you balance Luckily that? Luckily it's not in Poundbury. No, there's plenty of ugly in Poundbury. Don't worry. It's easy to find. You know where it is. Um, but you need a sort of about 20% discord to be a really happy person. If it's all beautiful, like if you were listening to just Mozart all day long, you'd go mad. Mm. Um, that's crucial, but uh, let's, this not, idea let's of not get the um, volume house builders onto Sublime just yet. I think they need <laughs> or, to or get fringed to, with a disgust. I don't think as, they need uh, to get to the first Anyone else want to respond? Uh, well, yeah, the, the, the um, dichotomy between the aesthetics of the beautiful and the sublime um, typified the sublime as. Uh, possibly terrifying, certainly uplifting and challenging. Mm. And um, um, I think you're right that you do need every now and then to be disturbed in order to challenge your um, received and all too comfortable and cosy um, yeah. protective yeah. shell. Next question was in the second row. <coughs> The problem with this whole uh, beauty enterprise is really its obsession with uh, the superficial appearance from outside. Uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a few years ago the Starter Homes Manual, which the government uh, published, uh, which was all about what houses should look like, but there wasn't a single plan in it. And it seems that this is a way, it's just a sop to, uh, to people who already own homes and, and, and not a way of getting homes built, really. Uh, this is simultaneously a government which is producing a, a commission on beauty, but also allowing permitted development, where you know office buildings are turned into flats uh, with with you know tight, tiny, uh, tiny space standards. 
mm. or no space standards at all. So my question is, should we just forget this discussion about beauty altogether? Yes. And concentrate, <laughs> on, concentrate on <laughs> delivering quality, which is, I think, something that we can far, you know, far more likely to achi uh, achieve consensus on. <laughs> Who agrees? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to disagree? Who thinks actually we should concentrate on beauty? I, I, I think beauty is really important. I, I don't think it um, is skin deep. I think, you know, actually, the, the, it's the threshold that, that, that is the, the thing that gives it moral and ethical orientation and value. And it's partly to do with orientation and sun and energy. It's also to do with the degree in which you're, you, you are allowed to be in different ways, mm. you can have privacy and you can be totally public. And that's the, pro the problem, however, with the image. I think Liza touched on it last week, is that, that like only two of the houses have got balconies and one hasn't. And that kind of picturesque disjunction is supposedly nice, but what about the fourth soldier who hasn't got a balcony? Actually, it's against the law. Hasn't got anywhere to put his bike. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's actually against the law. I mean, it's actually kind of specious and silly. It's, it's what, it, but this is a sort of bits of not joined up thinking. Mm -hmm. it know, is, it's like sorry. building regulations and planning law comes from the government. So why have they not it consulted anybody in that bit of, the, of Whitehall before they start? I mean, it would help if Oxford had a philosophy department. It is true to sorry, say that... Sorry, it's 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 sorry, it's slip. Had an architecture department. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, true to say that it is easier to live in a small, beautiful building than a large, ugly one. So... I lived in a flat, which I loved, um, on Great Ormond Street, in a beautiful early Georgian building, designed by no architect, put up by a house builder in about 1720. And it was absolutely tiny. It was 35 square meters. And I lived there for eight or nine years. I was really happy. It but you were on your own. I was. It, I was, I, which is fine. <laughs> But it's now lived in by a couple. Yeah, my good friends, Chris and Roy, took over my flat, and they've been there for five years. The, um, but there wouldn't have been room for a baby. But it is only 35 square meters, and what I'm trying to say is, if you talk to most developers today, you could never persuade a developer to build a flat for somebody, which is only 350 square feet. They'd, they'd go, you're mad. And actually, well, weirdly, it would be actually <laughs> not. There was a load of developers who want to go back to a back-to-back -back typology. Um, with really small flats, and they're actually, you and I have built some of these things in their, their offices in, um, in Victoria, and they were trying to persuade me to kind of scatter them all over Leeds as some kind of image of the past of the city, and I said over my dead body. I mean, I didn't get the job, but Peter Barber's championing back-to-backs. You know, yeah, I think Pe well, Pete, Peter, Peter Barber's an ex extremely talented architect, but, but the, the idea that you could just return to a, a Victorian typology and you could... Mm. You know, I mean, the problem with back-to-back -back is... Uh, uh, natural ventilation is a, is a real problem. So, so it's, it's actually quite difficult type to do. But they're, they're actually developers are. They're trying to challenge the government, but they're doing it because it's, it's, it's cheap. And there's certain aspects of human rights law from the EU which are in, in, embedded in the building regulations, which I think for, for, for very good reason. Which, but, but, but it's not all joined up. And I think, no. I think they would like to have something small. But it's not, I think you're partly right that it's not just about the size. It was about the ceiling height. If I, yeah. if I may, well, okay. I think that it's an, um, I mean, the, why it's so good that the, the dispute commission is because it brings people together to talk about what buildings look like. And there is one discussion that is about solving the puzzle. And that discussion is incredibly fun and fascinating and how good can we be at solving the puzzle, the puzzle of regulations and the puzzle of what the developer wants and so on. And somehow we get so immersed in that discussion that we never have the other one or we seem to argue for beauty through the, the problem-solving, puzzle-solving issues. And I just think it's, it's our loss to not talk about what buildings look like, which is something that has been done forever, for centuries, when the puzzle was not so complicated, fair enough, now yeah. the puzzle is very difficult. However, we should still talk about that. So it's very something to say, like, well, I, I, I hand to them for bringing this up. I mean, I think that is a very good thing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think I would disagree with you. Uh, I think beauty definitely does matter, but maybe yeah. the word is actually not correct. Maybe we should be using visual aesthetics of beauty, like as Ben said, is too much all the time, 100%. Actually, we're just talking about the you know, level of good enough. You know, I think if you really think about your behaviors as you walk around the streets, you do find yourself walking along, you know, more beautiful paths than like horrid ones. But if 
they do have an effect on you subtly, and I, I don't think it's something that we should dismiss. I think, I think the problem is, though, that the, the emphasis on visuality is, is partly the problem, because it's... Yeah, I completely agree. You know, yeah. it's, 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 a big, it's a big problem politically, I think. Can I Betty? bring Kate in? Sorry. Yeah. It takes me back to my initial assertion, which uh, Roger Scruton actually agreed with, that this is, uh, the root of this is it's a diversionary activity. Yes. That we have um, uh, the lowest space standards in housing of what's been coming off the stops in recent years of any country in Europe, Portugal, Greece included. There is one irreplaceable luxury which you should demand in your housing, and that is adequate space standards. The um, Homes for Today and Tomorrow report, Parker Morris report, was brought out under a conservative government headed up by Macmillan. It was Thatcher's, one of Thatcher's first acts in coming to power was to scrub that document which sets space standards, which were regarded to be regarded as minimal and all the boroughs in London adopted that, and later on it was adopted across the whole country. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why now, when um, the public housing has been sold under right to buy, and then after a few years yeah. it's sold on, first-time buyers are eager to get their hands on it yes. because it's very, very good value for money in terms of rate per meter squared. And... Uh, the, um, I, my suspicion is, my background suspicion is that this concentration on the external aesthetic is, a, is part of trying to deflect attention away from this fundamental problem and also that the government sees the next possibility for the expansion of the volume house building as being around the rural conurbations, yeah. where, of course, <laughs> the government's um, own support base lies, their political so support base. So they're desperate to soften them up. Okay, the final two questions. There's one right at the back, back left. And then the second one here. Right at the back. Can't hear a Sorry, word. Wait, wait for the microphone. Thanks. Sorry. Um, I was just curious to know if, if any other countries are models for what we are trying to do here uh, with the Commission um, in trying to incorporate popular taste, creativity in the architectural profession, um, and beauty. Where does it well? Where else in the world? Well, I think actually Spain before the crisis had quite, inter quite an interesting model. Just simply every public building had to be up for um, anonymous competition and that led to a lot of unexpected people to win them and that uh, was done for uh, uh, larger civic public buildings but also for social housing. So I think that was, I mean, you travel the, all cities of Spain and they all have some quite interesting, quite inspiring uh, and I would say mm. rather beautiful uh, recent buildings. Um, I'd say Switzerland is actually probably a good country, um, but it might just be because they're much smaller, but they're all very, very politically involved as well. So there's also a question, like, if we gave people the choice to vote, would they actually vote? Um, and then we would. what you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, perhaps, perhaps Switzerland then. Okay. Finland. 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 The housing, uh, the homelessness problem in Finland has is been so effectively addressed mm -hmm. with this shelter first policy and only after that after you've given someone the security of a home do you then deal with their substance abuse problems lack of um, education and all the, all the other things that go with it it's, it's so humane and they can do that because they're a much more egalitarian society Paddy, where's doing it well? Hackney. Hackney. <laughs> Hackney's just, they, they, they just give a project to Stephen Taylor, uh, Adam Kahn, uh, David Shipfield's just built something. They're on a mission. Is this the magic of Ken Morrison? Uh, it's Ken and Anna. It's also Phil Glanville. Um, there's a whole, there's a really talented team of people there who are taking the, the ethics and the politics and, and the, the, the 
the, the, the kind of the, the problem of modernist housing and the, the non-determinate landscapes and the dominance of the motor car, both like, really, really seriously. It's 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 amazing. Um, we did a, an exchange uh, with a, a museum in Stockholm last year, and, and we had we went to Stockholm, and some Swedish architects came over, and you know. Within the, the, the GLA architects, there was the there was the kind of hardcore Marxist that that, that, that didn't like this, the guys that like the Swedish lot, and so Sweden was always a model of, of, of really good housing. The architect in Sweden is, is is very 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 impoverished now. One of the problems of, of having its uh, 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 prescriptive space standards is basically what the architect does is a skin job, yeah. and it's all developer led. Um, and of course, everybody wants to be different. So you go to these places, and it's like being, you know, somebody wants to describe, um, you know, says, what, what was that movie like? It's like, like being trapped in a lift with, with Quentin Tarantino for three hours. I like a Quentin Tarantino film. But you know, it's kind of fine, but you can escape. But when you're walking around, just, it's like bits of Rotterdam are like this kind of. It's like you know, everybody's coked up at the dinner party, and every, somebody's forgot to cook. You know, the kids, nobody's, nobody's fed the kids. It's all kind of forgotten. <laughs> and so, actually, I think what's happening in Britain, weirdly, Kate, there, there is... I, I think we have to take our hats off to a man called Alex Seeley. Um, because he, w when he was working at CAVE, and then when he did a piece of work for um, uh, the, the GLA, has effectively written uh, what was a, a originally called uh, Mayor's Interim Housing Guidance, which is now in the London Plan, which defines room sizes, flat sizes, uh, daylight and sunlight provision, um, they're trying to kind of, kind of quantify things to, to stop bad architects and stop bad developers. Mm. And what that's leading to is that good architects are being given these projects because it's actually, as you said, really difficult to do architecture well. Yeah. Um, ben, is there another country in the model? I don't have very much experience abroad. Um, Charleston? Charleston? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I was in America last week and... Uh, uh, when I was really not wanting to feel depressed about the world, um, as we flew out of um, Atlanta, and you see the unbelievable uh, sprawl of the American contemporary landscape spreading out for not just miles, but forever, for as far as you can see. I'm always incredibly glad when I fly back into England, particularly at night, and you think, God, planning here really does work. Uh, <laughs> when you're kind of landing in, you know, Gatwick or Heathrow, kind of the, the, the two London airports, and you are s surrounded by, or you, you can, you look down on a country which is still fundamentally completely dark with tiny pockets of light, which are the towns and the villages. And that's actually, if anybody knocks the planning system is something I talked about. But it is being knocked every day by the government. <laughs> yes, the, the green belt. Final question just there. And then we'll continue in the bar. In the bar. Uh, yes, I, uh, well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, also, um, I was wondering, I feel it's something that every speaker has been kind of uh, talking about, like in every one of, 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 of your speeches. And I feel it's kind of the, the bush we're, we're sort of beating around in, in a way and everybody's proposing like, oh, what if beauty was uh, quality? What if beauty was uh, visual? But I feel that uh, you've all talked in some way or another about our relationship, either the relationship that we have with our buildings or the relationship that we have with each other. I think the point that uh, Miss um, uh, made about um, uh, the ugly intent between, um, and uh, what, what would you think if um, uh, architecture would be made in, in, a, in a, or architecture or city design would be made out in a way to kind of maximize and optimize our relationships and what if beauty would be hidden more behind what would our cities look like or what our streets look like or what the buildings look like if we would made them more out of love or more out of uh, uh, beautiful intent. So, and I would like to hear what you think about that. What if they were more kind of human centered, do you think? Yeah, sensibility uh, uh, to each other, more altruism in a way. If you can't create beautiful worlds out of ugly intentions, <laughs> what, what does it look like if you have beautiful intentions? I think was the question. Is that beauty? And what, yeah. Yeah. I'm not answering yet. Go and see tapiola. <laughs> Say again? Go and see tapiola outside Helsinki. Could you explain for those of us who haven't been to, to tapiola, <laughs> what, what's the magic of tapiola? It, it was uh, virtually a new satellite town which was built after the Second World War. Finland having suffered grossly during the Second World War because 
first of all, they had to fight, out the, fight off the Russian invasion, then they fought off the uh, German invasion. So they're virtually on their knees. But they have skills, and they have design skills. And one of the things I so admire about um, really most of the Teutonic <coughs> countries is, is their planning system, which actually they learned from us. We, we invented planning. When they put in a satellite town, first of all, they start off by driving in the transportation system so that you are not simply creating a car-dependent suburb. And they're driving through solid granite. We have only got to do, deal with a bit of chalk and marl and flint. I think that question's a little bit dangerous because in some ways you're suggesting that all of us up here do not design with altruism in mind, which I don't think hmm. is the case at all. I don't think that was the No, I don't oh, think okay. that's what he's suggesting saying at all. Question. I think a world... <laughs> I don't know, I didn't get that. I think a world of beautiful no. intention in this country starts with the landowner and with the economics. And... I mean, in our little practice, we are quite fortunate on the housing schemes that we're working for. By and large, I'm working for either a very, what you would call, enlightened landowner or a very enlightened developer. And I would say there are, there are very few of those around. Mm -hmm. And they're people who have a long-term view. They've got patient money. They've got a slow approach to life. They're not actually seeking an immediate return. And... Whether you agree with his aesthetics or not, I think the Prince of Wales is one of those people who fundamentally cares about things outside of his own immediate concern. He's got broader concerns. And when he was tackling the built environment 25, 30 years ago, struggling in a naive and, in a sense, kind of uh, amateurish way to kind of figure out what he felt when he was a lot younger than I am now, um, he... He understood that, and Poundbury is the result of, and the other developments which the Duchy of Cornwall mm -hmm. and similar landowners carry on with, it's very slow and patient, but the issue that the Commission is trying to grapple with is fast money, and that's mm -hmm. a whole separate question. So you can, you can find the examples of the beautiful world, and it, it, it might be a beautiful contemporary scheme, it might be a beautiful traditional scheme, they're out there. And in a way, I keep myself in my bubble by just working on those ones. And it's really tough. Every now and again, I've tried to sit down with Persimmon Homes or the big volume PLC house builders. It's really tough. It's really tough to change anything in their system. And as I always say, it's a bit like the, ch the chicken, the organic chicken movement by Jamie Oliver and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall about 15 years ago, made a big TV program and everyone was talking about chickens, and there, there is still only 1% of the chickens consumed in Britain are organic or free-range. 99% are just churned out of a factory, and housing is quite similar to that. And so we're all in a nice world where we can focus on the nice things. But it, So you can find the beautiful world. The question is how the hell do you apply the lessons of the beautiful world to the ugly world? Lara. <laughs> Oh, I think <laughs> How do you do that? If, I, if I may, I, I think also uh, there, I mean, you invented planning, but you also invented the developer <laughs> way of thinking. <laughs> and uh, therefore, yeah. I would say that there, there are also other ways to have homes that don't rely on this like higher level or like yes. top down idea that you have to purchase from a developer and so on. Uh, interestingly enough, l last year we were looking into uh, studying this uh, system that was developed in, in Sweden or with the build your own home movement, which was a way to tackle a housing mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. And then like, what, the, what can people do by themselves? What does people need help for, which is basically foundations, uh, the basic structure and so on. And That's it was right. incredibly fascinating to work, in this case we were working with the uh, wood industry in Sweden to figure out like, what can we provide that, um, that could help people build their own homes and maybe do it in stages and do it in a way in which they have choices. What that also brought back was the idea of how um, centuries ago when people was building their own homes and style became more available, then you had style catalogs, which is also, again, like bringing it back to from problem or puzzle solving 
to maybe ideas of aesthetics and beauty is maybe also yet another resource uh, to provide to like how can one uh, have access to basic notions of design, to basic notions of aesthetic decision making without maybe necessarily having to directly hire an architect. And there is people working quite interestingly in these ways who like architects and designers who practice through getting sponsorships and basically putting up videos on YouTube and people using that. So I think yeah. we can also think of different ways of making um, architecture accessible <coughs> and realizing architecture in ways that are not only coming from developers. Any other final concluding remarks that you want to make? I, I just think the London plan should be uh, nationwide because the, 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 a lot of the problems that you're dealing with is like the windows are just too small. They've got stupid mullions which aren't insulated properly. There's, there's naff aesthetic ideas chucked on that don't make any sense. There's a kind of art of building stuff. But the other thing I just realised the English invented was, was um, building regulations. There's the London plan that came in in response to the fire of London. Mm -hmm. So the Georgian aesthetic, yeah. which, which gives you kind of concrete round the window frame because it stops the spread of fire, which bounces light into the interior, blah, 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 blah. blah. There's a kind of... Um, I'm sort of torn a bit between... You know, Oscar Wilde thought the solution was uh, that rich people should just give him all of their money to spend for them. <laughs> which I think at the kind of heart is what architects think should happen. <laughs> but, th but they don't like what we spend it on. Um, I think, I think there, th th there is this challenge <laughs> in what we do, which is, which is to, uh, to, this is going to sound, sorry to Edward, are we, are we out of touch now in our ivory towers? <coughs> well, I think the task of the architect is to, is, to, is to teach the client how to be virtuous. That's Alberti's description of the, 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 the job, as well as everything else which is that everybody wants to be virtuous if they can make money out of it or they don't need to lose a huge amount of money. But to do that is this kind of pragmatic, uh, philosophical, practical wisdom, as Gadamer puts it. And it, it's, it's deeply embroiled in all sorts of things which are quite ugly and quite difficult and quite nasty and, and dark about the human species. Mm. And, you know, territorialization, blah, 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 blah. Those things are kind of weird, privacy self-image, they're, 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 they're quite difficult. Um, the most kind of amusing and witty thing I've ever heard an architect say, which is also the most depressing, was when I was a student, I went to see Jean Nouvel talk, who's, you know, je suis un homme de nuit, and he kind of, he, he, he works really late, and he's kind of, you know, he wears black all the time. Wears an amazingly sinister hat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had a witch doctor. I had a, cl had a client who, who who had done a project with him who said it, he wears black apart from in August when he goes to his 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 house in uh, the south of France and he he's helicoptered in the client with his um uh, uh, to go and see Jean Nouvel and and Jean was all dressed in white and he was uh, doing yoga on the parterre of his baroque schloss and um and the client walked up to him put his hand on his shoulder Chateau and said. Remember, you might think you're Jesus Christ, but I'm God. <laughs> I think that's the perfect image to end on. <laughs> and a, a note to all architecture students that your role is to make your clients more virtuous. I think that's a, a great point to end on. Um, in two weeks' time, we're going to be talking beauty in the planning system with Grayson Perry, Amin Taha, Alpa Dapani, Rosemary McQueen, and Nicholas Boyce-Smith. So hope to see you then. And could you please thank our panel, and thank you all for coming.